From ABC News, World News Saturday, here's Carol Simpson. Good evening. One day after observance of the 20th anniversary of Roe v. Wade, anti-abortion demonstrators took to the streets in more than two dozen cities across the country today. Thousands marched, chanted, and blocked entrances to abortion clinics to protest legalized abortion and President Clinton's lifting of some restrictions on abortion. Hundreds were arrested. ABC's Dennis Trout has a wrap-up of today's activity. Opponents of abortion rights took their protests to the streets today in angry demonstrations in cities from Washington, D.C., to Philadelphia, to Denver, and Dallas. Police arrested hundreds of people for blocking the entrances to clinics, and activists promised to keep up their pressure with political action as well. Yesterday's actions show that President Clinton is fast becoming the abortion president. He's clearly in the pocket of pro-abortion pressure groups. Resist elected officials that are promoting rebellion to God's holy law and replace them with men and women like George Washington and Abraham Lincoln who fear God and honor his law. The immediate battleground is Congress where the fight is over a bill which some call the Freedom of Choice Act. It would give the Supreme Court decision sanctioning abortion the official stamp of Congress and go several steps further. It would also weaken state restrictions which now require parental consent for children seeking abortion as well as outlaw the rules in some states which provide for waiting periods prior to an abortion. Abortion rights groups, still cheered by yesterday's White House rulings, predict that they will win in Congress as well because they are no longer on the defensive. The bottom line is that Planned Parenthood will be here for our patients long after Operation Rescue either goes home or goes to jail. Such confidence brought out abortion rights supporters celebrating yesterday's political victory in Atlanta and other cities across the nation. The Clinton White House directives have given the struggle a new focus, but have not even begun to settle the issue. Today's demonstrations suggest that both sides will only become more combative. Dennis Trout, ABC News, Washington. Embattled FBI Director William Sessions came out swinging today, launching his own counteroffensive to a Justice Department report accusing him of abusing his office for financial gain. Sessions said the report is the result of extreme hostility toward him from George Bush's Attorney General. As ABC's Kathleen Delasky reports, the Sessions problem now belongs to President Clinton. President Clinton invited reporters into the Oval Office to see him working overtime on his first Saturday, but well, he would I not discuss the fate of the FBI director. Will you be keeping Mr. Sessions up? I, I don't want to talk about Thanks, it. Thanks, guys. We have to That's it. That's it. 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 William Sessions wants to talk about it. He's calling this week's scathing Justice Department report on his conduct inaccurate, incomplete, and biased. His lawyers today issued a 26-page rebuttal. For example, they say he did not spend $10,000 of the taxpayer's money on a useless security fence at his home. He only spent $37.50, and in Sessions' judgment, the fence provides plenty of security. As for the charge that he uses government planes for personal travel, Sessions' lawyers counter that all the trips in question involved significant FBI business. In response to questions today, the White House press secretary said the president has the power to fire Sessions before his tenure term is up. She called the ethics charges disturbing. But I think Sessions has to have a chance to respond too, and so counsel is going to review both the allegations and his response and make a decision based on that. If the president decides to fire the FBI director, William Sessions made it clear he'll go kicking and screaming. He plans to start Monday lobbying friends on Capitol Hill. His position is best summed up by the last line of his lengthy rebuttal, quote, a lot of mud has been slung. It will not stick. Kathleen Delasky, ABC News, the White House. The author of the report, Justice Department Counsel Michael Shaheen, told ABC News tonight that despite strong suggestions by Sessions, the allegations were not made by a single disgruntled former FBI employee, but rather by scores of individuals who gave testimony under oath. The FBI director will make his first public appearance since the Justice Department report was released tomorrow on This Week with David Brinkley. There are more troubling headlines on the way for House Ways and Means Chairman Dan Rostenkowski. In tomorrow's editions, the Chicago Sun-Times reports that Rostenkowski broke congressional expense allowance rules by spending more than $68,000 to lease three vehicles and taking immediate ownership of them. Health officials on the West Coast are bracing for more reports of food poisoning 
linked to suspect hamburger meat used by the jack-in-the-box fast food chain. So far, there has been one death reported, that of a two-year-old boy. And several other children are hospitalized and in intensive care. The latest from ABC's Gary Shepard. Signs of the food poisoning have already shown up at 13 jack-in-the-box fast food restaurants. The problem has been traced to contaminated hamburger patties that have caused customers to suffer severe diarrhea and stomach cramps. At least 10 children have been hospitalized. 150 customers have reported some health problems. The most likely mechanism would be undercooking of the hamburger meat. Jack in the Box has ordered its restaurants to cook hamburgers longer so they reach a higher temperature and any remaining bacteria is killed. At present, we are highly confident the food we are serving in our restaurants is safe and wholesome. We will continue to cooperate fully with health officials as they continue to investigate the outbreak. Health officials are testing hamburger patty samples and first trace the contaminated meat to this California warehouse operated by the Vaughn supermarket chain. Vaughn says it is confident its processing did not cause the contamination. Health authorities are now blaming the problems on the slaughterhouse which is being investigated. Meanwhile, the search is on for 23 cases of frozen hamburger patties that came from the same lot but cannot be found. Gary Shepard, ABC News. Coming up, U.S. warplanes respond to a provocative attack in Iraq's southern no-fly zone. And later in this broadcast, the new battleground in the struggle over equal opportunity in college athletics. And a new direction for American cinema, letting the audience call the shots. World News Saturday, brought to you by the fun ships of Carnival Cruise Line. For the third day in a row, U.S. warplanes have responded to provocative actions by Iraq. Three Navy planes on night patrol came under anti-aircraft fire in the southern no-fly zone. One, an A-6 attack jet, responded by dropping a 1,000-pound laser-guided bomb on the Iraqi artillery position that attacked them. All three planes returned safely to the aircraft carrier USS Kitty Hawk. In Baghdad, an open letter to President Clinton appeared in a newspaper run by Saddam Hussein's son. The letter expressed regret at the lack of response to Iraq's peace overtures, and it warned the new president not to play with fire. President Clinton and Russian President Boris Yeltsin spent about 30 minutes on the phone today, and although they didn't set a time or place, they agreed to meet face-to-face -face sometime in the near future and to have their top diplomats meet soon to work out details. There was more trouble in South Lebanon today when two Israeli soldiers were killed by a roadside bomb while making their night patrol. Earlier, three British helicopters evacuated 17 more Palestinian deportees from their makeshift tent city in South Lebanon's no man's land. The latest from ABC's Dean Reynolds. The Palestinians clamored to get on board the British helicopters today. Four were so sick they needed urgent medical care. 13 others were expelled by mistake. Only two of them will actually go home. The rest are going right back to prison in Israel. It leaves almost 400 men accused by Israel of supporting terrorism still stranded in the no man's land between the Israeli and Lebanese armies, still demanding that Israel return them to their families. Today, Israeli officials insisted the return of the 17 was only corrective action and did not signal a retreat from the government's position. Our basic uh, position is uh, the same, that those people have been uh, deported and this is it. But with Israel television reporting that a majority of Prime Minister Rabin's cabinet now favors the early return of most, if not all, of the men, and with the United Nations threatening to impose sanctions unless that happens, the pressure for a change in policy is mounting. For the time being, the focus is on the Israeli Supreme Court, which is expected to decide on Monday whether the government's original order to expel the Palestinians was legal or not. Dean Reynolds, ABC News, Tel Aviv. Fire and smoke continued to pour from a ruptured supertanker north of the Indonesian island of Sumatra, while its growing oil slick appears to be drifting away from land and toward the Indian Ocean. Firefighters and salvage workers appear to be gaining some control over both the fire and the oil slick. 
When we return, why more and more Americans are facing the perils of working part-time. Creating new jobs is one of the most important challenges facing President Clinton. Today, more than 100 million Americans are employed, but nearly 20% of them are in part-time jobs, not all of them by choice. And as ABC's Ron Claiborne reports, their ranks are growing rapidly. Joanne Lawrence works for a small property management firm, but by her own choice, she only works three days a week, so she can spend more time with her four-year-old daughter. A full-time job would have meant that she would have been in daycare from like seven in the morning till six o'clock at night. We just didn't want that. But there are also more than six million people who work part-time only because they can't find full-time work. People like Steve Kingsbury, a computer graphics artist. Eight months ago, his employer cut his work hours in half when business slackened. You do have the, the guarantee of some money coming in, uh, so that's good. Uh, but then you also have the worry about where are we going to get the rest of the money. Part-timers have become the fastest growing segment of working Americans, a trend coinciding with sweeping corporate cutbacks. In 1987, Wells Fargo Bank began replacing its full-time tellers with part-timers. Today, half of its 30,000 employees work part-time. If you have a pool of talent that you can draw from in a task that only requires two or three hours to do, uh, the company has a great deal of flexibility by being able to just call its talent pool up and say, we've got a job for you to do. But most part-timers get no health insurance or other benefits, and their wages average almost 40% less than what full-time employees make. The problem is that many companies use part-time workers not because this fits in with their business needs, but because they see this as a way of reducing their labor costs. As a candidate, Bill Clinton called on American businesses to improve productivity, to create millions of new high-wage, high-skilled jobs. Critics of the trend to more part-time work say it's creating instead a workforce that is increasingly low-wage and low-skill. Ron Claiborne, ABC News, Los Angeles. There's one industry that's hoping for a big boost because of its association with the new president. ABC's Jim Slade reports. They're on the road again. Bill Clinton's campaign may have done for buses what Harry Truman's did for trains. To make them seem like regular folks, both candidates went from little town to little town in regular folks' transportation. Naturally, the people who represent bus companies weren't going to let the moment pass. I told you we should have come to the inaugural by motor coach instead of driving. Relax, we'll find a parking place any day now. Without trying to take advantage of it. It's a convenient way to travel, it's an easy way to travel, and just ask the president and look where it got him. But there's no sign yet that his bus trips have had any real effect on the general traveling public. He'll have to come to my house, pick me up, so I can ride with him. Only way. I wouldn't want to take a trip on a bus. Sometimes train, sometimes plane very seldom by bus. Buses have changed from the ones in the country tunes where the guy hawks his guitar for a ticket back to true love. Today they're called motor coaches and the most profitable part of the business is luxury charters. The association is so pleased they even put one like Clinton's in the inaugural parade with the president's driver behind the wheel just like old times. President Clinton has a limousine now but you never know if he wants to take a few friends along. They've talked about Air Force One, Marine One, and Bus One, and I would make us happy. But only if he's not in a hurry. Jim Slade, ABC News, Washington. Bus One. Coming up next, John Snyder sitting in for Dick Schaap with today's sports news. What have you been working on tonight, John? Well, Carol, the men's title has been decided at the U.S. Figure Skating Championships, and many female collegiate athletes are up in arms over what they feel is unequal treatment. Some have taken their protest to court. Now let's go back to New York for John Snyder in today's sports news. John? Carol, the men's title at the U.S. Figure Skating Championships went today to a young man from Great Falls, Montana. 20-year-old Scott Davis, one of the rising stars in American skating, was second going into the finals, but he skated well, beating Mark Mitchell to win the men's title. They will both go on to the World Championships, the women's final tonight here on ABC. In college basketball, number 15 UNLV got a great game from J.R. Ryder, 40 points. UNLV was a 16-point winner over number 18 Georgetown. UNLV now 11-1, Georgetown 11-3. Well, the lion's share of the attention in college sports goes to the men's teams, but financially, and men's and women's sports are supposed to be equal, or nearly so, and that has not been the case. 
As ABC's Arma Gatillion found out, many are not happy about it. We're just as competitive as they are. We train just as hard as they do. We all feel like second-class citizens, like they don't care about our sport nearly as much as they care about the other varsity sports. Women are fighting back, demanding equal opportunity to participate in college sports. To arrive at the ultimate goal of gender equity. At last week's NCAA convention, the hot topic was Title IX, the federal law which prohibits sex discrimination in college sports. Not that schools have been eager to comply. You don't see one institution in this country that I know of, at least right now, that is in compliance with Title IX. So the institutions aren't, aren't willing. The courts are going to have to apply pressure. Pressure now building from a flurry of Title IX complaints and lawsuits that can cost schools millions of dollars in legal damages and the loss of federal funds. The current Title IX battleground for women's athletics is here at Brown University. Today, both the women's gymnastics and volleyball teams are locked in a bitter legal battle with the administration in a case that could determine the direction of college sports across the country. Come on, I. A university-wide budget crunch eliminated funding for four varsity sports, including women's gymnastics and volleyball. The cuts cost women's sports $62,000 a year, just 16000 for the men. I think they didn't think we'd make a fight. I think they, they'd say, oh, too bad, you know. They'll be a little upset, but they'll get over it. But they didn't. Instead, nine female athletes took Brown to federal court, charging the cuts, which exempted popular sports like men's football and ice hockey, unfairly targeted the women. While Brown's student population is almost evenly divided between men and women, the men make up almost two-thirds of the school's funded varsity sports. If women are here to men, are they going to cut back like this? Or are they going to cut back from the men first until they get to equality? And that's really what it's all about. My understanding, again, of Title IX is that it does not require a direct correlation between the enrollment of men and women and the participation level of men and women athletes. Uh, what it requires us to do uh, is to meet the interests and abilities of our students. And we have done that. For the gymnasts who must now raise money for food and travel, trying to keep their team together, Brown's argument rings hollow. Brown has taken away all the opportunities for, to help me to achieve my full potential as an athlete. And I don't see that happening with the basketball players, you know, or the football players. My goal was to get a college scholarship. I got the college scholarships. I turned them down to come to Brown University, and then they cut my sport. The case goes before a federal appeals court next month as colleges and athletes nationwide wait to see whether women will move forward in their fight for equality or take a significant step back. Armin Katayan, ABC News, Providence. While college officials say they are not certain how they will pay for equality, they realize if they don't find a way to do so, the courts may do it for them. Carol? Thanks, John. When we come back, play it again, Sam, but not the same way. great thing about going to the movies has always been it's so easy. You buy your ticket, you get your popcorn, you sit down and relax and let someone else entertain you. Until now. A new kind of movie is on the way, and as ABC's Jim Hickey reports, it puts the audience happily to work. Believe it or not, these people are watching a movie. They are also directing it, choosing plot lines, telling characters what to do by pushing buttons next to their seats. It is computer-controlled technology called Interfilm. Basically what we call Interfilm is a cinematic game. It's not quite a movie and it's not quite a video game. It's something in between. Going to the party? Being tested in New York, the film features three main characters who periodically turn to the audience for advice. But now you have to make a choice. Do you want to go to the party with one of them or with me? Yes. When the choices appear on screen, the audience pushes the corresponding colored button. Majority rules, and the plot takes off again in one of 68 different directions. You can scream, you can press as many buttons as you want. Uh, there are no rules at Interfilm. All right, here's my offer. And you can play and watch as many variations as you want. Either way, we kill him. What do I do now? 
Who are you talking to? Us! He's you talking to us! Her. Good choice. Just scream it out and having the audience participate is wonderful. I have control over this film. I can make this film go the way I want it to go. In recent years, the number of people going to the movies has declined. Sophisticated home entertainment centers, movie rentals, and cable television have seen to that. The producers of Interfilm are banking on its novelty to bring more people back to the theaters. But movie critics are skeptical. The whole purpose of film is to tell us a story, to take us out of ourselves, to allow ourselves to have a voyeuristic, escapist experience. And pushing a button in order to choose what's going to happen at every moment breaks that magic. We're not trying to replace the movies. Uh, you know, certainly some of the best laughs and some of the best cries I've ever had is sitting in the darkness watching a movie happen to you. And, and that always will be the case. Still, Interfilm producers have plans to go nationwide beginning next month. And people who watch their films won't just sit there anymore. Jim Hickey, ABC News, New York. I'd like to try that. That's World News Saturday. I'm Carol Simpson. Good night. From Washington, this has been World News Saturday. This has been a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source.